Take it away. Okay. So I'm going to talk about chronic kidney disease and felines. Um, so the healthy kidneys have many jobs in the body. They conserve water, um, so they're dehydrated, they'll uh, concentrate the urine so that more water stays in the body. Um, they're responsible for filtering waste and toxins and removing them in the urine. Um, they'll regulate blood pressure, um, also the calcium and phosphorus balance and other electrolytes. Um, they also help with red blood cell production uh, by producing a hormone called erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production by bone marrow. Um, and they help conserve proteins, so if you have a lot of protein in the urine, that's not good. Um, and they help regulate blood pH. Okay, before you go on, wow. I mean, that's a good summary of what the kidneys do, and it's, you know, most people think, okay, the kidneys make urine and that's it. But, you know, look at all these other things you mentioned. And the other thing about water conservation, Sometimes an animal will be making a lot of urine because of some disorder, and you might think, oh good, the kidneys are working well. No, the kidneys, their claim to fame is to conserve water, just like you said, and make a very concentrated urine. So if an animal's making a lot of urine chronically, that's a bad sign, because then things are just flowing through, because if you remember, there's a thing called reabsorption. So a lot of water gets filtered through the glomerulus, but then almost 99% of it gets taken back into the body. And so once a kidney is starting to make a lot of urine, that's usually a bad sign, unless of course there's a lot of water and you're drinking a lot of water and you're exercising. But that's a good little summary there, yeah. Okay, so um, with chronic kidney disease, um, the kidneys are it's a persistent loss of kidney function all the time. Um, so the microscopic, uh, unit of the kidney is a nephron, um, and there's kind of a nephron right there. Um, that's a glomerulus. It's like a little capillary network that where the blood is filtered, um, and the blood goes out through a little artery and then, or a little vein, and then everything else is kind of works its way through here into the urine. Um, so basically with uh, chronic kidney disease, the nephrons die, um, so typically the kidney, as the disease progresses, the kidney will shrink as the nephrons die. Um, basically, when two-thirds of the nephrons are lost, uh, their body can't conserve water anymore, so they'll have very dilute urine. And when 75% of the nephrons are lost, you will see a definite increase in the blood creatinine, which is a, um, a waste product from protein breakdown that we normally uh, get rid of. Yeah, because that's in the blood, not in the urine. So if it's right. appearing in the blood, that means it's not getting out in the urine. Okay, so some possible causes of chronic kidney disease. Um, a lot of times it's unknown or it's really hard to tell um, because sometimes the symptoms can mask um, the cause. Um, or it can be a congenital malform malformation of the kidneys, like a birth defect, a chronic bacterial infection, or uh, hypertension, or a uh, high blood pressure can also cause it. Um, it can also be brought on by acute kidney, kidney disease. Um, some causes of that are like if the cat ingests antifreeze, lilies, or human strength anti-inflammatories. Um, the interstitial nephritis is a common cause for chronic kidney disease. It's a combination of inflammation, uh, cellular degeneration, and scar tissue forming in the kidneys. Um, the cause of that is a lot of times unknown, but it could be due to an infection or injury to the kidneys earlier in life. Um, or it can also be caused by immune diseases, like glomerular nephritis or lupus. Okay. So some of the symptoms of chronic kidney disease in cats, you'll see polydipsia and polyuria, which is uh, drinking a lot of water and urinating a lot. Um, you'll see incontinence because the bladder is full a lot, so over time it'll be harder for them to hold in all the pee. Um, you'll see vomiting, diarrhea, and poor appetite. All of those uh, can lead to weight loss. Um, and you'll see depression due to all the waste products building up in their body. Um, and anemia because they're not producing enough red blood cells or may have trouble with that. Um, 
and weakness associated with all, all of these symptoms, basically. Mm -hmm. um, some of the less common symptoms, but it can happen. Um, see weak bones uh, or fractures. Um, see, uh, again, high blood pressure, which can rarely cause uh, sudden blindness, as well as itchy skin um, and bleeding into the stomach or bruising skin. So with diagnosing chronic kidney disease, um, you'll look for obvious signs on the physical exam like dehydration, weight loss, pale gums, um, ulcers in the mouth. Um, another thing is bad breath. Um, I read that uh, preventative dental care can really help with uh, preventing the onset of this because of all the bacteria in the mouth that they have to filter out. Um, but you'll need to confirm it with a blood and urine tests. I just will look for signs of anemia, increased blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine, because those are waste products that are not gonna be filtered correctly. Um, especially the creatinine is what they really look for. Um, they'll usually have increased phosphorus in their blood, uh, low potassium, because they're urinating all of it out, and they'll have dilute urine because they can't concentrate their water. Um, and they may, might have protein or bacteria in their urine. Also, their platelets might not be as sticky as they should be. Um, and look out for bruising at the side of blood draw because of that. Um, the typical staging is a one to four system with four being the most severe and the highest level of creatinine in the blood. Um, some other tests that you can do, but you may not uh, need to. You can do x-rays or ultrasound, which can look at the kidney size, because typically with this disease, the kidneys get smaller. Um, if the kidneys are normal size or even bigger, it could be something else like uh, lymphoma of the kidneys or an acute thing that's not necessarily chronic as long as you treat it. Um, if biopsy, you probably don't need to do, but it might help you, it could confirm a congenital cause for the chronic kidney disease. Um, and if you have related animals to that animal, that could help you with the decision not to breed them. Um, you can do a bacterial culture. If there's, if there's white blood cells seen in the urine, then you should do a bacterial culture to see if there's an infection either causing the chronic kidney disease or chronic kidney disease is causing an infection. Um, and you should test the clotting ability um, if you're going to do a biopsy. Yeah, before the biopsy. Yeah, before. <laughs> I should be number two. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, I wanted to show you these pictures. Um, this one is a normal kidney. Um, you can see the cortex is the lighter gray part on the outside, and then the medulla is these darker parts on the inside. Um, and this is a kidney with chronic kidney disease. Um, it's a little bit harder to tell the boundary between the medulla and cortex. The structure is not as clear. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not as organized. Um, some factors to consider when treating. Um, I think most vets will recommend um, a renal diet. Um, typically those are have less protein but higher quality protein because the uh, kidneys work hard to uh, filter the protein. Um, and they'll usually be low phosphorus and sodium, and they will be high in water-soluble vitamins, like the B and C vitamins, because those are lost um, when we can't conserve water well. And you always want to introduce the diets gradually because cats can be pretty picky about their food. Um, and again, water, they can't really conserve water. Um, to make sure they're drinking enough, you might want to try like flavored broths or canned foods so they're getting water like with their food. Um, but a lot of times they'll be polydipsia, so you don't really need to worry about that. But I would say that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the water soluble vitamins lost in the urine, so you want to supplement those maybe. Um, the potassium, a lot of cats with chronic kidney disease become hypokalemic, um, which is low blood potassium, and they can get weak and painful muscles. Um, one way you can help with that is to supplement potassium, and you can give that with potassium gluconate, which is a, that's an example of it. 
or citrate, and those are given orally. Um, so a lot of cats with chronic kidney disease, um, they can have elevated uh, parathyroid hormone, or they can be hypoparathyroid. And having all that hormone around draws calcium and phosphorus from the bones, which is why phosphorus is so high in the blood in these cats. Um, usually the renal diet will help with that. And if not, you could try these other drugs called phosphate binding agents, which uh, kind of keep them from being absorbed out of the digestive tract so that they're lost in the stool. Um, and then anemia, because there's less earth per uh, fewer red blood cells produced, and they get more anemic. And you can supplement with iron or give it an erythroproietin, erythroproietin injection or blood transfusion if that's a big problem for your cat. Um, and they can't regulate sodium efficiently a lot of times. Um, and sodium is really important um, when it comes to hydration. Um, an excess of sodium causes you retain water um, and causes higher blood pressure. And low sodium can cause dehydration. Um, you can manage that with um, different drugs. Um, there's one class of drugs called ACE inhibitors, um, which basically prevents this uh, substance called angiotensin II from being produced, uh, which causes vasoconstriction. Um, vasoconstriction is like constriction of the blood vessels, so it uh, Your blood pressure increases goes blood up. pressure. Yeah. Right. <coughs> but these drugs prevent the vasoconstriction, which helps with the blood pressure issue. Um, and another drug called amlodipine can also be given. Okay, before you go on, I, this is a nice little diagram of one beginning of a nephron, and this is a glomerulus, and what's kind of interesting with the anatomy is, you know, afferent means coming into a point, right? So here's an afferent arterial, but usually every time you leave a capillary bed, you'd have an efferent venule. But look what the diagram says, efferent arterial. And that's one of the kind of a characteristics. There's place, other places in the body that does this, but the kidneys have really an arterial, capillary bed, arterial. That's weird, okay? That doesn't usually happen. And the point is, another thing about this drawing, does the diameter of the afferent arterial look bigger than the diameter of the efferent arterial? A little bit. <clears throat> and you know what that is? That's normal because then that tends to make hydrostatic pressure here, and this is where the crude urine is formed. So if you have a bigger pipe coming in, a smaller one coming out, then you're gonna have some natural pressure built up here and water, crude urine, is gonna leak into this Bowman's capsule. And then this is the beginning of that nephron that goes down and up and there's a lot of things happening. But I mean, this is a great for kidney review. So this is called filtration. So a lot of things get filtered, like glucose gets filtered, but that's bad if it, it gets into the urine. So then what happens further in the nephron, a lot of that stuff gets reabsorbed back into blood and that's called reabsorption. <clears throat> Sorry about the voice. But then even further, or other spots along the nephron, some things that are in blood get put into the crude urine, and that's called secretion. So the kidney is incredibly important in doing all this stuff, and you know, I like the point that you made. It wasn't until two-thirds of the nephrons are dysfunctional that you do see something. See, so what before that, it's subclinical. It could be like really bad or not so bad, but then over time, if you get two thirds affected, then it spills over to something that you can see. Yeah, yeah that's why it uh, usually takes so long to oh, yeah. diagnose a cat or right. even notice that there's a problem. And then you look at how complicated it can be. You know? And there are veterinarians that are board certified nephrologists. Because I had a student one time that worked in Chicago, and she worked for a board certified nephrologist. All I think it was a man. All he did all day was see things referred to him. You know, he didn't do the vaccinations or anything. It's like he was like the nephrologist. I mean, amazing, complicated. Okay, uh, this is just a little bit of data from a cat renal diet study. Um, so, cat, um, and it was taken over a 24 month period. Um, so overall with the renal diet, the blood urea nitrogen was lower, 
for those cats and the blood bicarbonate was higher. Um, uh, the higher blood bicarbonate is important because it offers the blood, which can prevent um, acidosis, which is also common for chronic renal failure. Um, and zero percent of the cats on the renal diet had a uremic episode, um, and with the maintenance diet, 26% uh, had a uremic episode. And with the renal diet, there were no renal deaths, and with the maintenance diet, there were 21% of the cats died from renal causes during the study. Um, and the numbers are here from a different study, but, and again, the renal diet, the average survival was <coughs> over a year longer than with the maintenance diet. Okay, um, some things to remember. Uh, that is progressive, there's no cure for this disease. Um, but with treatment to manage the symptoms and keep the cat comfortable, they can live for months to years. Um, and it's important to minimize the stress so that they're eating and drinking well. Um, and diet is very important. Oh, and this cat is Majik. Um, he's an in-house cat at the clinic that I worked at last summer. Um, he basically just lives at the clinic they can't find home for. So, uh, <laughs> But she has kidney problems, but as far as I know, all she gets is the kidney food, and she's been doing a lot of that. And she's in the best place possible, a vet clinic, oh, yeah. you know, so I mean, health is right there. Yeah, she's doing pretty good, I think. She's been at the clinic for a few years, I think. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Okay, questions about kidney disease? Anybody have experiences out there with kidney disease, feeding a diet, whatever? Here we go. Um, I know in my internship at the zoo, I actually um, watched as the vet took an ultrasound on the tiger, um, and she said she started to notice some signs of like a kidney disease, mm. early signs of kidney disease. Yeah, how, long, how old was the tiger? Oh, um, he's pretty old, okay. which is, yeah, it's older. So maybe, yeah. yeah. This is um, really, really prevalent in geriatric cats. Okay. Like okay. almost half. If they wow, if they live long enough, something's going to get you. That's the point, yeah. Um, so my dog has chronic kidney disease. Um, and one thing that we find is he is like a big problem with like the palatability of his diet. Um, he doesn't necessarily like the kibble food um, as much. Um, and I know like cats can be very picky. So um, the, I think, I think it's the Hills um, KD diet. They have like canned food. Um, I don't know about cats, but like, do they have that or like other forms of food, like wet food? Like for dogs? Well, for cats. Yeah, for cats they have a, the canned food and dry food. Okay. Yeah. And what's neat about canned food, if your animal isn't drinking enough, does anybody know what percent water is in canned food usually? What percent, if you look on it, you know, it'd say a certain percent moisture. What's the average for canned food? 80% water. So that big can is 80% water. So yeah. 